Twitter. I don't know how many of you are on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. It's part of how I keep track of the news and what's going on in the world. Um, and of course, you, we all know uh, Elon Musk has bought Twitter. It's now week two, uh, or we're going into the third week of, uh, is it the third week or the second week? Anyway, um, uh, Elon Musk owns Twitter and he's in charge and he's the boss and he dictates policies. And as I told you from the beginning, when this first came up a long time ago, Two things are going to happen. One, it's going to be fun to watch, and it is absolutely uh, fun to watch. And second, it's going to be more challenging than he thinks on multiple fronts, both on the content moderation, which is not easy, not simple, not straightforward, as he's discovering. And second, on the financial front, Twitter does not make money. Indeed, Twitter bleeds money. It's had some profitable periods, but it's not significantly profitable. And right now, it's bleeding. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, it has never figured out, Twitter never figured out how to really make money on the platform. Advertising is minuscule as compared to things like Facebook, Google, other, uh, you know, big tech companies. So, uh, Facebook, so Twitter... Is, is, is right now losing money. Uh, that was bad enough in the old structure when it was a public company and uh, it had little debt. But now it's a private company owned by Elon Musk and maybe a few other investors. And it has $13 billion in debt. It's uh, just its, its interest payments on the debt, uh, it, you know, interest plus principal that it has to pay on the debt annually is going to be about a billion dollars. It has to make that money. It, of course, also has to make money beyond that, at least enough money to keep the office open. So Elon Musk is challenged with getting the company profitable. Now, one of his first moves was, you know, that blue checker, that little check mark that people get to authenticate themselves? Twitter would never give me that. I tried a number of times to get that blue check mark. For whatever reason, they, they refuse to authenticate that I am who I claim I am. I, I don't know why it was so difficult. But um, he is not charging people for the blue checkmark. Maybe now, if I pay the eight bucks a month, I will get a little checkmark next to my name. I don't know what advantage that gives me, but maybe people will believe that the Iran book um, a Twitter account is actually Iran Brooks and not some other fake. I don't know. Anyway, maybe it helps in the algorithm. I don't know. I'll try. It's worth eight bucks a month. I'll try it and see if it makes any difference. But anyway, uh, he's charging eight bucks a month for people to do that, right? And it's um, eight bucks a month. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how many people pay that. But even if everybody pays it, and even if he adds some people, that's not going to solve his problem. So his problem now is marketing. His problem is advertising. Now, you know, Elon Musk is a genius. Uh, you know, he's obviously done an amazing job uh, with rockets, uh, a, a somewhat amazing job. I'm, I'm not as excited about the job he did at Tesla, but it's somewhat, you know, amazing job at Tesla, although, again, I hate the, the, the extent to which he got government subsidies is quite stunning if you actually look at the numbers um but okay the guy's a phenomenal engineer and a manager but the real question is do all those skills translate into a business like twitter which is very different this is a software business not a hardware business this is a business that has a lot to do with re gaining revenue you you know both all of uh, Elon Musk's other businesses, with exception of PayPal, all of his other businesses relied on revenue from the government. Uh, you know, Tesla could have never succeeded without uh, subsidies and, and primarily uh, carbon credits, massive, hundreds of billions of dollars of carbon credits. Uh, and of course, uh, SpaceX could not exist without contracts from NASA and from the federal government. So, uh, Elon Musk is very good at generating revenue from the government. Is he good at generating revenue from advertising agencies? Is he good at getting people to 
engage on a platform um, that is about ideas or about connecting, about communication, very different than spaceships and automobiles, even very different than um, finance and, and, uh, and payment systems. So I, I, I'm not saying you'll fail. I'm saying it's not going to be easy. It's a real challenge. And the blue check mark, eight bucks a month, ain't gonna do it. That that doesn't pay uh, the interest on a year's worth of that. I don't think pays the interest on one month worth of the of interest on the debt. So he's gonna have to figure out the revenue model. He's gonna have to figure out a revenue model, um, and I don't know how he does it without advertising, and I don't know how he keeps the advertisers and grows advertising given his, uh, you know, without some kind of content moderation and how that fits in with his commitment to having very minimal content moderation. So we'll see. It's going to be really, really interesting and, and fun, again, to watch. And I, you know, I hope he succeeds. I want Twitter to be successful. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I actively engage on Twitter. So I, I, I have every incentive in the world for Elon Musk to succeed and to grow and to grow the audience and to make it even easier for content creators like myself or, or, or public intellectuals like myself to use Twitter to leverage our access to the world. So Twitter is going to be super interesting to watch on a revenue perspective and a business perspective, just from the business dynamics. How do you create a business out of the shell that is Twitter? The second question is where is, of course, oh, oh and, and by the way, just go back to the business side of it, which is interesting. On Friday, supposedly half of the staff, 3,700, something like that, uh, people who worked at Twitter were laid off, were fired. Uh, there are all kind of legal issues. There's already a lawsuit against uh, Twitter around the firings, but that's stupid California and federal law that, that restricts the ability of business people to, to do what they need to do in order to, to run a business. So you, you have to let people know if you can have a mass firing, you have to give 60 days notice, all kinds of nonsense like that that was meant to protect unions in the days of unions. Or really is meant to protect workers now that most workers are not unionized and and again, some really, really bad laws relating to employment status. But putting all of that aside, um, a lot of people laid off on Friday. It turns out, it, it looks like, again, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out, um, it, it, it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on, but it looks like some people were laid off that then Twitter regretted laying them off. So over the weekend, they were rehiring some people that on Friday they had laid off. So, you know, confusing times, but again, I, I think the press makes too much of that because when somebody comes in and restructures a business and makes big changes and lays off a lot of people, A, mistakes are going to get done. It is messy. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not fun for the people involved. Uh, I hear some people are sleeping at their desk at Twitter in order to try to keep their job and, and, and get all the work done. I think that that um, Musk is sending their way. It's going to be fascinating to watch how uh, the restructuring goes. And, and most corporate restructurings, nobody pays attention to. Nobody cares. They happen uh, you know, somewhere else, um, and, and, and nobody really pays attention to it. And, and corporate restructuring is, a, is an art. There are very few managers in, um, in history that have been good at uh, corporate restructurings. I remember there was one in the 1980s and 90s. His name was uh, um, Al, I can't remember his family name, but he, they called him Chainsaw Al. Chainsaw Al, because when he came into a business, vroom, the chainsaw came out and he, and he cut, 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 cut. And he was brilliant at it. And he knew exactly what he was doing and he reoriented the company, focused them, cut out all the waste, uh, sold off uh, assets that weren't being one being properly utilized, focused everybody's energy around one goal and one mission and one track. Al Dunlap, thank you. Uh, Chainsaw Al. I met Chainsaw Al once uh, at the end of his, after his career when he was already retired. Um, and he was, he was brilliant at it. 
And then he took over his last company. It was a company he took over. And he decided to go soft. And he decided that this time he was going to heed the criticisms. And this time he was going to be nice. And this time he was going to, quote, build for the long term. By the way, he would do this, cut, 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 focus the energy, and then sell the company, which is brilliant, right? Brilliant, economically valuable, uh, you know, uh, productivity adding in every respect from an economic financial perspective. Fantastic. This is, this is capitalism, you know, markets working at their best. The final company, he, he said, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, invest. I'm going to think long term. I'm going to run this company long term. I'm going to show them that I'm not just one, a one trick pony, that I can't just, I'm not just Chainsaw Al. I'm, I can also build companies over the long run. Complete flop. He had to quit the company, you know, almost went bust. He had to quit the company kind of in disgrace. And that was his final job, which is kind of a tragedy for somebody who had been so productive, so successful, um, so value adding, so wealth creating throughout his career to, to, to leave on such a downer. But a lot of times that's what happens when business people who are very good at something try to be something that they're not. Try to be something that they're not. <laughs> Frank says, I know a bunch of labor people in w WBA who would hate your honor saying now, yeah, they're wrong. I will take them up on this anytime. I will match the, you know, the history and the standards uh, of, of uh, what it takes to run businesses and how to make them successful, uh, particularly in a free market, not, you know, not in a market where the Fed is manipulating interest rates to zero, but in a really dynamic, competitive free market, you sometimes, not always, sometimes have to be ruthless and you have to do these restructurings. It's called um, creative destruction and it's, it's crucial. It's a part of what um, business and, and markets require, what competition requires, and ultimately, Gail is right, it's called justice. Because keeping an unproductive job is unjust. It's, it's a form of subsidy, it's a form of welfare, and it's unjust. Anyway, it, part of the issue here is that businessmen, the fact that you're good at something doesn't mean you're good at everything. And, and I think Chainsaw Al learned that. And is Musk good at restructuring? He's never really done it before. He, he, he didn't have to do it at PayPal. He never did it at Tesla. I don't think he's really done it at SpaceX. We'll see. I hope he's good. I hope he's successful. But the fact that the guy's a genius in one area does not necessarily make him a genius in every area. Business is complicated. Business is hard. Figuring these things out is not easy. Okay, second issue. So that's kind of the business issue, which I find fascinating and, and look forward to watching. Um, second issue is the content moderation. Uh, now, supposedly he's forming a committee to make decisions about content moderation. He's already decided that that check mark that people pay eight bucks to get um, is only going to do after the election because he doesn't want to create any kind of bias that might appear. Um, he, you know, one of his content decisions has been that anybody who changes their name, uh, you know, so you know how you can have, you know, the at, the at you on Brooke, but you can actually put on top of that, you can see, a, you know, object, a, you know, public intellectual, you can put, you can put some other name. So people were using, were saying Elon Musk. You could see it wasn't Elon Musk because the at was some other name. But people were putting Elon Musk and making fun of him. So he basically banned that practice. You can no longer declare yourself to be Elon Musk when you're not Elon Musk, even though it's obvious to the people that you're not Elon Musk. In other words, you can't have any more of these um, uh, parody accounts. So he has made those uh, illegal. On, and he's actually, he's actually thrown out a couple of people, at least one person, from Twitter for having such an account. So... He's discovering the hard way that it's not 
that easy to figure out what should be acceptable and what should not be acceptable. It's not that easy to be in a position where everybody's making fun of you and you just let it go. Um, so it's going to be really interesting what ultimately they come up with his content moderation um, council or, or board of advisors. I also think the other aspect of this I mentioned earlier is what do advertisers want? What kind of content moderation do the people who are going to buy big chunks of advertising on Twitter? And if Yeah. So, you, but if you, uh, but if you, um, if you change the content moderation, will you have to go out and find new advertisers, and will you be able to find them? So, Taisy, Taisy corrects me. She says you can have parody accounts, but it has to say it's parody somewhere very noticeable, somewhere very obvious, rather than you know. Whenever I see something, I verify: is this really Elon Musk? Oh no, it's not, because you can see from the at account that it's not. But anyway, uh, you know, so uh, it's interesting that he's going to have to figure out what the boundaries are, what a parody account is or isn't, uh, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what gets advertising in, what scares advertising out, all of that, right? All of that is going to be uh, not easy, and he's discovering that. He's discovering that. Um, I'm still looking forward to see what happens. Right. Uh, I'm still looking forward to seeing what happens and how it works. And um, again, I, I super hope that he is successful. And I super hope that he comes up with some kind of content moderation standards that are objective and straightforward and understandable, and we can all follow them. It's a private company. They can set their standards for moderation any way they want. But what hasn't happened in any social media hasn't happened in um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, any of the places, is kind of objective standards that it's easy to read, understand, and then know if you're breaking the rules or not. That's what's missing. It's objectivity. So I have no problem with whatever moderating standards they come up with, as long as they're easily understood. Um, and they're not missing, you know, interpreted at the whim of some Twitter employee, right? Objectivity and a way to, um, I would want objective rules and then a way to um, challenge them, a way to say, wait a minute, I didn't violate the rules. Look, and, and, and some kind of process by which there's a hearing in which you can argue against. That would be, and again, an objective process. So that would be cool if they did that We'll see what they come up with in the end. I mean, they might do what some other platforms do, which is just say, okay, if it's legal, you can say it. But, but I, I worry for them about what happens with advertisers. No platform has been economically successful doing that. We'll see if, um, if Twitter can be. Last comment on Twitter, and this relates to the election. Um, and more comment on Elon Musk rather than Twitter. Elon Musk today tweeted that you should vote Republican tomorrow, and the reason you should vote Republican is that you want divided government. So I think he's been listening to your Ron Brook show, and uh, he's come to the conclusion, or, or he's adopted the conclusion that uh, divided government is best, that gridlock is superior to any one political party holding uh, all levers of power. And um, <laughs> what, uh, you know, the problem is I don't really believe Elon Musk. I don't believe that um, if a Republican was in, this, in the White House right now, he would tell people to vote Democratic. I don't think that's in him. I think he shifted to the right. I think he shifted towards Republicans. And I think he is going to advocate for voting Republicans from now on. Uh, in a significant way. We'll see. He could change his mind again. But um, I think it's disingenuous of him to say vote Republican tomorrow because we want divided government. You can say vote Republican tomorrow because we want divided government when Biden is in the White House, but that's not what he said. He said generally we want divided government. But uh, so I do think we'll, you know, I think, I think we'll get divided government. One way or the other, we'll get divided government tomorrow. 
not because of Elon, not because of me, but because I think that's where the country is swaying. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, all right. So let's do a couple of Super Chat questions, $20 Super Chat questions, and then we'll jump over to uh, staying positive. Um, again, if you want to ask questions, the Super Chat is available and open. You can ask anything. It's better than just asking a question or making a comment on the chat. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, as I said, the problem with all these platforms is that the rules, the, the, the standards are non-objective. The problem is arbitrary. How do you create objective rules? And uh, what are those objective rules? How do you communicate them? And how do you create a process by which you can, um, uh, you can adjudicate them properly? I don't think it's as simple as people think to create those rules. I, I think it's possible, and I hope Musk can come up with them, but I don't think it's as simple as people think it is. I don't think Musk's, I don't think the, the political uh, arena shifted under Musk. I think he shifted to the right. I think he, uh, it, it, like many others who were of the center and of the left, have come under the influence of people like Jordan Peterson that have shifted them to the right. So much of what uh, Elon Musk says and tweets about a number of different issues sound like coming right out of the mouth of Jordan Peterson, coming right out of the mouth of certain people on the right, um, that it's not an issue of the political party shifted. He has shifted. He might not want to admit that. He might not want to recognize that. But he has shifted his views on a lot of issues rightward in a not positive, not always positive way, in a, in a mixed way. So, uh, no, I, I don't think it's just the Democratic Party became uh, moved away from him. He has moved away. Both things happened. The Democratic Party went left and he went right. All right, Michael Sanders asks, did you ever consider moving to Hong Kong when it wasn't under control of Chinese or Singapore? Or are these regions not dramatically freer to make crossing the language and cultural barriers worth it? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's not worth it. Um, Hong Kong, for me, I, I completely understand people who do it, but for me, it wasn't worth it. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? Um, Hong Kong, you know, had its challenges. It, it, was, a, it was an amazing place. It, it was a native place to visit. I, it's a, you'd have to be willing and interested to live in a, very, very intense environment, a, a, a very crowded place, a very high energy place. Not my lifestyle, not what I would have wanted. Also very hot and humid, uh, all year, really all year round, uh, very tropical, and, and a very, very different culture. So difference wasn't worth it. And Singapore, while is economically significantly freer than other countries, socially, it's not free at all. There's no real free speech in Singapore. There's no, uh, many of the social freedoms don't exist there. There's way too much arbitrary and random power that the government holds. Now, again, I understand why people move there. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy place to live. It's comfortable. Again, very hot and humid, but not quite as intense and crowded and, and high energy like Hong Kong is. It's just a little bit more laid back. Um, but because of the economic liberty, I understand why people would want to live there, and, I, and it is a beautiful place. It, it, but it's, it, it wouldn't be enough for me, the economic freedoms, particularly given that you're giving up non-economic liberties by living in Singapore. But I, again, I understand completely people who live there. All right, Max... If you could completely rewrite one sector of domestic U.S. policy, education, immigration, trade, land, U.S. policy, which one would it be and how would you rewrite it? I mean, basically, I think the most important one, if I could do only one, it would be education. 
Um, but the problem with education is you would have to do it at, at, at every state level. So I would basically eliminate public education. If I could do that, if there was one thing I could do, I would eliminate all public education because everything else will flow from that. That is the one that is most sustainable. That is the one that will have the deepest, longest, most substantial impact. So I would switch the entire U.S. to a, um, what do you call it, a uh, education saving account. Education saving account. So, um, we will, uh, you know, that, that would be the one. All the others are all good. Uh, they were all important. They all would have uh, impact, but that one would have lasting impact. That would have impact on generations, not just on the economy in, in a little bit. And it would have implications on everything else. If you just change immigration, it wouldn't change education, trade, land use. If you just change trade, it wouldn't change all the others. Education ultimately leads to everything else changing for the better in deep, substantial ways. Uh, Max says, what's your opinion on prediction markets, specifically political prediction markets? Is there any reason to look at the polls when they seem to be far better at predicting the actual outcomes? Um, I mean, I'm in favor of prediction markets. I, I think people putting their money where their mouth is is always good, but uh, it, it doesn't mean I, I don't think they're necessarily better. I, I haven't looked at any kind of studies that have compared prediction markets to polls, <clears throat> so I don't know if they've been consistently better over time. I mean, markets are good, but markets are, are fallible, just like polls are. Um, you know, the, the, the bond market did not predict inflation. It's a market. It's a prediction market. If you think about interest rate, you think about the bond yields, they are predicting future inflation. Um, and... Um, The, uh, the, the bond market as a prediction market failed when it came to predicting future inflation. So markets are not necessarily good predictors, but they're as good as it gets. They're as good as it gets, um, particularly for a layman who's on the sidelines. So uh, prediction markets, polls, I don't know. I'm curious what prediction markets are right now saying in terms of uh, the elections. I also don't know how deep prediction markets are, I I political prediction markets how much uh, volume there is, how, how, how many people participate, um, to, uh, you know, so how deep, how much trading there is. Do they have prediction markets and all the little races that add up to the big rate, to, to the total, or are they just predicting, you know, who wins the Senate, not particular races? But I'm curious, what are the prediction markets saying right now, and how do they compare to the polls? My expectation would be that there's very little difference right now between prediction markets and uh, 538, you know, and, and, and the aggregation of the polls. That, that would be my expectation, but if you're on the prediction market, you can go and test that out right now. Um, William Anthony says, here in Australia, our two biggest exports are coal and iron. Does our country have a future when we create very few complex products? How do we get more countries producing electronics, entertainment, and medical products. I mean, you know, the way to do it is basically to improve education. So you got to get smart people. You got to give them the tools to be able to produce these other things. And then you've got to deregulate. You've got to deregulate uh, finance. You've got to deregulate the allocation of capital. You've got to deregulate um, you got to get out of the business of um, controlling these things. You got to get out of the business of in, um, subsidies. My guess is Australia subsidizes to some extent natural resources, um, makes it easy for more and more and more capital to flow in there rather than to flow into other industries. So, uh, you know, if you want, you know, the best method is free markets. The best method is to get government out of the business of business, completely out out of the business of finance and to protect property rights. And then you see what happens. That could be that some countries focus exclusively on natural resources, and that's fine. That's a possibility. But, 
you know, it's not inevitable that that is the outcome. My guess is Australia would have a pretty diversified economy if it was liberated, if it was free, and if it had a, a, a decent, a, a good education system under a free market. So, uh, but, but look, one of the beauties of globalization, and I'm a huge fan of globalized trade, is specialization, is, is the idea that uh, different people specialize, but different countries specialize in the things they're particularly good at um, and, and don't have to be diversified. But I don't think a country like Australia should be so exclusively focused on natural resources. Um, it, 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 it should be, there should be other things that Australia has a relative advantage in. Oops. Uh, Gail says, uh, I wonder what you think of Paula's policy of speech. I think Amy Pipkoff's chief policy officer uh, has an objective policy on speech within the limits of the law. Yeah, I mean, I think they basically allow all speech within the limits of the law. I, I don't know. Um, I, the question is, uh, how much money are they making? How many people are participating on the platform? How many advertisers do they get? So you can create objective standards that nobody wants. That is, you know, this is, this is the complexity of it. It's not enough to say, I want to maximize the ability of people to say whatever the hell they want on my platform, and I'm going to let them say whatever the hell they want on my platform. As long as they don't violate the law, they can say whatever they want on my platform, but then nobody comes, and, and nobody wants to use the platform because there's some things they don't want to hear. They don't want to be in a, in a, in a, on a platform where people are saying certain things. So... You've got this constant, you've got this constant um, challenge of, on the one hand, um, wanting open expression and wanting people to talk, although I don't think that's necessary. I think you can set whatever rules you want to set, right? I, I, it's, a, it's a private company. I emphasize these are private companies. They should be able to set whatever, whatever rules they want. Um, but you have to set the rules in a way that attracts users, people who use your platform. And you want to set the rules in a way that attracts advertisers so that you can generate revenue. Or if you have a different revenue model, you might, you might want to attract journalists to use your platform. Or you might want to attract intellectuals to use your platform. I don't know who you want to attract. It depends how you build your social media platform. Uh, so it's, it's not enough just to say you can come and say whatever you want. There has, there's a market here. There's supply and demand, supply and demand for a variety of different things. And one of the things there's supply and demand for is for speech. It, you know, there might not be a demand for the kind of speech that some people want to, want to spout. And in that case, you can ban that speech from your platform in order to cultivate the demand, the kind of demand that you want. So... I, I, think that, I think it's a good thing that there are multiple platforms that have multiple standards and let the market decide which one is best. So far, with all Twitter's problems, Twitter is winning. No platform comes close to Twitter. And why? Because that's the platform most people want to use. With all the problems that it has, with all the horror that it has. And I completely understand it. I mean, this, there are limits to how much of a certain points of view I want to be exposed to uh, in a social media platform that I'm engaged on. So I completely understand limiting what is said on a particular platform. If I was running a, a platform, I would have standards. The challenge, as I've said many, many times, is to make those, those standards objective. And it's not an issue of free speech. It's not an issue of the First Amendment, unless the government gets involved. But as long as it's a, a private decision, then it's a private decision. And you get to decide what the standards on your platform are going to be. And then the market gets to decide whether they want to use your platform or not. It's the beauty of the marketplace. All right. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, 
we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Your Own Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.